welcome to episode 277 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. I'm Will, and with me as always is my co-host and husband, Mr. Jeff Adams. Hello, everybody. This is the Big Gay Fiction Book Club episode for the month of December, and this month's pick is the groundbreaking romance All Through the Night by Suzanne Brockman. Before we start our deep dive discussion of this month's book, we'd like to quickly thank the members of our Patreon community, including brand new member Mary. Thanks so much for joining us, Mary. It's because of them that we are able to bring you podcast episodes every single week with interviews from your favorite authors and reviews of some of the best books our genre has to offer. On the Big Gay Fiction Podcast Patreon page, members get early access to the book club episodes and author interviews, as well as an exclusive monthly bonus episode that can't be heard anywhere else. Patrons help keep this podcast running and fund the transcription of the author interviews, making sure that the show is accessible to all readers and listeners. If you're in a position to help the podcast grow and would like more information, simply head on over to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. I am super excited for this book, so let's dive into this discussion. All Through the Night is part of Suzanne Brockman's best-selling Troubleshooter series. And the two main characters in this particular story have a very long history going back several books. And if you'd like to know more about that history and the how and the why Suzanne Brockman created these particular characters, we recommend you check out the listener favorite episode featuring Brockman that aired on December 7th. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that episode, please do so. It's really exciting to listen to her talk about her long endeavor to get gay characters into her books and then what she did with these characters in the Troubleshooter series. It's really inspiring and wonderful to hear her tell the tale. So All Through the Night features FBI agent Jules Cassidy. In the beginning of our story, he has hopped on a plane from D.C. to Boston, where his boyfriend, Robin Chadwick, is wrapping up his HBO series. Robin's character has gotten a new story arc for next season, and he wants to talk about what that means for their relationship. And after an extended series of phone tag messages, Jules decides to show up and talk in person. They meet unexpectedly in front of the hotel just as Robin is leaving to go see Jules. But Robin has checked out, and there's a room shortage in the Boston metro area. It's a parents' weekend at many of the local colleges. So there's no room at the proverbial inn for our two heroes. This was so adorable to me. It's like one of those classics, I'm coming to surprise you, but wait, I'm coming to surprise you. And now this thing has happened where there is no room for anybody. I thought it set up their relationship so well and we should say of course and you mentioned this Jules and Robin have been a thing now for several books in the Troubleshooter series by this point we're continuing our trend of bringing you into the middle of the series as we want or want to do but you immediately see here their connection and their love for each other and it's really delightful now to add insult to injury Jules has gotten food poisoning from a bad airport taco They go to hang with Jules' friend Alyssa, who happens to be in town on a job for troubleshooters, which is the private security firm that is the basis for the entire series. Once Jules is feeling better and resting comfortably, Robin has a late-night heart-to-heart with Sam, Alyssa's husband, one of the heroes from a previous book. And their talk gets serious rather quickly, and Robin realizes that their childhoods were equally crummy, and they might have more in common than he originally thought. Sam gets a little holier than thou when he tells Robin he better not hurt Jules or else. But Robin can dish it out too. Sam's protective instinct might be well-meaning, but it is misguided. Robin would never hurt Jules and is planning to propose. So, in the dark of the hotel room, laying in bed, Jules and Robin hash out their future together. Jules has plans to transfer to Boston so that Robin can continue working on a show. Both of them will finally be living in the same city. Robin proposes, and Jules says yes. It's so sweet. This was the first of many aws that I had in this book. I don't know that it's the best thing to do to propose immediately after a food poisoning incident, but given everything they'd been through that night, it also completely worked so well. And I have to say, too, that the heart-to-heart that Jules and Sam had, I mean, we've seen these conversations play out in so many books where the best friend is like, do not hurt my friend. Do not do it. And this one was really nice because these two guys who have history in the Troubleshooters books of bumping heads a little bit really kind of made their peace here. And it was really nice to see that and how much the actor in the Navy SEAL really had in common. 
Suzanne Brockman does something interesting here. In a traditional romance, you would get the point of views of our two main characters, in this case being Robin and Jules. But because so many of the characters that we're going to be meeting have a history in the series, and we've seen the relationship of Robin and Jules develop through their eyes, several of the secondary characters get viewpoint chapters as well. And in this particular case, as I was reading along at the beginning of the book, I was sort of surprised to see the story being told from Sam's point of view. Yeah, it's unique. This whole book is a little bit unique, right? Because it's a romance book, but you've already got these two characters who have created their romance. I mean, this is like the cap of their happily ever after to go through and get married, because that's not something you always see in a romance is like the marriage that happens or much less to spend a whole book around that marriage and she does it in a way that also allows you to drop into this story i hadn't read the previous books and while that might have enriched this book had i done it i feel like i got a complete experience i got to know who these guys are i got to know who the friends were i didn't have to go i wonder what they've been up to before because there's just enough information there to tell me for example with robin and sam that they've not always gotten along but there's no info dump there's no previously on the Troubleshooter series, it just works so organically. Now, the renovation of their new townhouse, well, new at least to them, is an unending comedy of errors. When Robin and Jules arrive home from an afternoon out in the slushy Boston winter, they begin to strip out of their wet clothes, much to the surprise of their gathered friends and family who have come for a surprise wedding shower. So cute. And this townhouse, think the movie The Money Pit, because that is exactly what this is, and it will be a recurring character all of its own. (laughs) Yeah, things get pretty rough. Now, Will, a reporter, brazenly crashes the party, blending in with everyone else, looking for a scoop on the upcoming nuptials. He has a brief conversation with Robin, who thinks he works in the production office of his show, and Robin tells him that if he wants a sit-down meeting with him to talk to Robin's assistant, Dolphina who, upon seeing her, falls instantly, madly in love. Now, Dolphina is intrigued, but really doesn't have the time for a guy who has obviously crashed the party. Yeah, she does not suffer fools. She is very matter-of-fact. She is very protective of Robin and Jules, and Will has, you know, violated all of that stuff, so he does not start off on the right foot with this woman at all. Jules doesn't have patience for a party crasher either. Once he figures out he's a reporter, he asks him to leave, right before they find Robin on the front steps covered in mud. He's managed to get himself locked out of the basement, so he had to crawl out an egress window. Yeah, in particular, Robin and this house do not get along well. (laughs) And it's then that they get word that the president will be attending the wedding. Their quiet little ceremony just got a whole lot bigger. Yeah, and this is big stuff. Keep in mind that this book was written in 2007. Marriage equality had happened in Boston. And you'll hear, if you go back to to Suzanne's interview, you'll hear the history of all this. But, you know, the mere idea of the president coming to a wedding of two gay guys in 2007 would have been jaw-dropping, to say the least. In the days before Thanksgiving, the hits, they just keep on a-coming. The article comes out, and it is a total shit show. Mm -mm -mm. Yes, it is. (laughs) Robin gets the news that his show has been canceled. And Jules is called away to Afghanistan to help with a situation involving Al-Qaeda. When Jules' boss arrives on Robin's doorstep, it's with the news that Jules' hotel has been bombed and they're working on getting Jules and his team back home safely. Here is where some of Suzanne Brockman's storytelling technique shines, is that she's able to pivot the story from the wedding and start to inject some of her trademark romantic suspense elements into the story. It was a really exciting sequence here, seeing this play out between the folks waiting in Boston for news and actually seeing what was going down in Afghanistan. Yeah, I first read this book when it came out in 2007. And while I enjoyed the whole book, this next upcoming sequence was something that stuck with me. And the way that Brockman kind of explores the tension as Robin is waiting to find news about what happened to Jules. But in the middle of all this, Will arrives explaining that his notes were hacked, and he wants to show Robin the real article he wrote. That, as it turns out, won't be published because the war in Afghanistan is the current headline news. Will has a buddy in Kandahar reporting in the middle of the action, and Robin, who's desperate for some news about Jules, will essentially forgive and forget Will for access to Will's reporter friend. Their house fills with the wives of the other troubleshooters, all of them there to support Robin. 
In the middle of the night, Will finally gets news from a source that Jules and the other members of his team are pinned down by insurgents, and the situation is dire. In Kandahar, things are getting desperate. As enemy forces move in, Jules fights to live to see Robin again and to see his wedding day. When all hope seems lost, a SEAL team moves in. They're rescued, and Jules and his group are choppered out. This is a really amazing sequence. I mean, like you said, there's so much emotion and so much suspense going on here. It ratchets up in both Boston and in Kandahar. And we get to see that Will's also a good guy. I mean, there are hints of it, but he really comes through in the end here, despite showing up at possibly the worst time he could have arrived on the doorstep in many ways. It's really some masterful storytelling here. I was so just into this part of the book as it moved rapidly through uh, this sequence. It also shows the power of the friendship of the troubleshooter team that everybody comes to rally around Robin, too. While all this is happening, Dolphina babysits Will's 12-year-old niece, who is precocious and inquisitive and ready to genuinely sing her uncle's praises. Such a cute child. It's then that Dolphina reads the real article Will wrote about Robin and Jules. When Will finally arrives home after a long night to share the good news that Jules and everyone else got out safely, she kisses him, but doesn't want to admit that she likes him. They agree to be frenemies for the time being. This is another interesting thing that Suzanne does here, because, I mean, this is Robin and Jules' book, 100% because of the wedding, and they're out front. But she also weaves in a brand new romance in the middle of it, but manages not to have that romance overshadow, essentially, their big day. (laughs) Robin and Jules are able to talk by phone, glad that Jules made it through the ordeal and they'll be able to spend Thanksgiving together. Robin also gets the good news that although his show got canceled, his producer is busy whipping up a brand new project just for him. Will has reluctantly agreed at his editor's insistence and Jules' request to write a series in the weeks leading up to the big day. When he arrives at the townhouse, he witnesses all the fires Dolphina must put out concerning the complicated issues involving a wedding that the president will be attending. He also witnesses the fallout when Robin receives word that his trash bag father won't be attending. So while Jules is comforting Robin, Dolphina flirts and banters while trying to maintain some level of professional boundaries with Will. And as it turns out, there's also an issue with Adam, an actor X with a complicated history with both of our heroes. He's been getting threatening emails that are involving Robin. Yeah, If you think your family's Thanksgiving was hard, Thanksgiving in their household for this particular year was, I mean, everything that could have happened kind of happened between doing the wedding planning and these threatening emails and a reporter on the doorstep. It's a lot. Jules contacts Adam to see if the stalker is real or if it might just be an excuse to get between him and Robin. Both, as it turns out, are true. I admired the fact that at least Adam admitted that he was trying to cause trouble. It was a bit of a ballsy move on his part to ask for help and also admit that he was trying to get in the way. But yeah, he's an interesting character. Jules eventually agrees to look into the threatening emails and gives Adam some next steps to legally protect his privacy. Next, Jules contacts Sam to talk through the security hassle of one of the wedding guests being flagged by the Secret Service. He also needs to talk through the fact that he can't bring himself to watch the dailies from Robin's new show. It seems Robin's got some love scenes with several guys in the pilot episode, and Jules is green with jealousy, but hates to bring it up with Robin, not wanting to rock the boat of a wedding that has already become more complicated than they originally planned. I really liked seeing this aspect of Jules. There's a lot of history that goes on with Robin. Robin is a recovering alcoholic. This will play into some of the proceedings coming up. But it also is why Sam had so much to say, because Robin has hurt Jules in the past because of his alcoholism. So there's that aspect to it. And for big, bad, tough FBI guy to say that he has trouble with his actor husband messing around with these guys. It was a very interesting, nice bit of vulnerability for Jules, I thought. The guest list for their bachelor party is primarily made up of Navy SEALs, people who work for troubleshooters, a lot of characters from previous books, and they all gathered to play a game of laser tag. Best wedding party ever. <laughs> but it's the playful heat between Dolphina and Will that's the focus of this particular scene. They're very busy flirting and falling in love, even though they don't want to. Will is unable to put his investigative reporter hat away and wants to ask questions of Jones, the guest who is the focus of the Secret Service. 
Will has dug up all sorts of uncomfortable secrets about Jones's past before he got his new name and new life. And Dolphina is furious that Will has been caught in a lie yet again. But the outing of Jones leads to a job offer with troubleshooters and the opportunity to write about what happened to him in Indonesia in a book he'll write partnering with Will. So all in all, it's a very good turn for Jones and his family. Dolphina yet again has to deal with the fact that Will seems more focused on getting what he needs for his career than, in some cases, doing the right thing, which would be not snooping around, maybe in her laptop sometimes. Yeah, for these two characters, it's really interesting to watch the development of their relationship. In this case, it's usually one step forward and two steps back. Very, very true. At the rehearsal dinner, Will is finally able to talk with Delfina, who has been avoiding him like the plague. She's not interested in giving him any more chances. Meanwhile, Adam continues to receive threats from his mysterious stalker, and when the cops in L.A. won't take him seriously, he makes his way to Boston the day before the wedding, where Sam, Alyssa, and Jules assess the genuine threat. Now here, as we head towards the finale of our story, is where Suzanne Brockman really kicks it up a notch when it comes to the suspense and action elements. A guy named Jessup, it turns out, is the crazy stalker, and he's convinced that Robin has an evil robot double, and he shows up on Robin's doorstep. Will happens to be there to take some pictures for the next article in the series that he's writing. When Dolphina opens the door, Jessup shoots Will in the leg. Sam, Alyssa, and Jules figure out that Jessup is indeed on the East Coast, and most likely has followed Adam. And they quickly head over to the townhouse where Robin, Dolphina, and a bloodied Will have to deal with a deranged madman. The sequence in Kandahar was the beginning of the suspense in this book, because now we've got this situation... And you're right. I mean, Suzanne just increases that tension level step by step. You're just sitting there going, oh, don't open the door. Don't do this. Ooh, don't do that. Because you could just see what's going to come with this crackpot. And on the other hand, it was really awesome to see the, the troubleshooter team just kind of swoop in and deal with it, too. And they arrive just as Robin and the crazy pants stalker wrestle for the gun. Jules uses his FBI training to knock out Jessup, and Will is rushed to the hospital. In the aftermath... Adam makes one last childish attempt at stoking Jules' jealousy by flirting with Robin. Sam shoves him out the door, and Jules and Robin finally have a chance to sit down and talk about Jules and his jealous streak when it comes to Robin. It turns out that Robin doesn't mind Jules' possessive streak, and once he explains his process as an actor, Jules, as it turns out, is the inspiration for his Take Charge character, they realize that they may not be perfect, you know, far from it, but they are perfect for each other. They are. And what I love here so much, I mean, we've talked about on the show multiple times that I hate the moments that happen because two people aren't talking to each other or having the conversation that they need to have to avoid a bigger misunderstanding. These two guys talk, and I love that so much. It Yes, it does take Jules time to figure out how to talk to Robin about this, but the point is he does it. And he does it before he messes things up completely and then has to go back and kind of grovel about it. I adore these two for that. And I wanted Adam to get punched. I really wanted Adam to suffer for what he was doing and trying to mess with them. I wanted Sam to be much more hardcore with him. But (laughs) Sam was polite and restrained, but still got him out of the picture. On the morning of the wedding, Will, who is fine, by the way, is hoping for a grand declaration of love from Dolphina when she visits his bedside. But she surprises him by saying that nothing has changed and she leaves him to go to the church. But things at the church aren't going exactly to plan. Robin went home to get a gift for Jules he left behind and promptly locks himself in the master bathroom. Let's be clear. The house locks him in the master bathroom. (laughs) He did not do that to himself. (laughs) The house has come for him yet again. While everyone is frantically searching for the missing actor who they all assume has fallen off the wagon, Jules figures out where he is, and when he arrives, he finds the groom-to-be lodged in a hole he's created in the wall between the master bath and the bedroom. Think Winnie the Pooh and the honey tree right here. (laughs) So ridiculous. (laughs) They manage to get cleaned up and make a mad run to the church. And as our two heroes say their I do's, Will makes his grand gesture by showing up. Dolphina has rethought some things. After she sees the faith that Jewel has had in Robin, she finally admits that she loves him and gives him a great big kiss before sending him back to the hospital to recuperate. (laughs) I love you now. Please go finish getting well. Yeah, no, exactly. (laughs) 
In the back of the limo on the way to the reception, Robin gives Jules a CD featuring music that will help them decompress after such a stressful ceremony. It seems their first time together was in the back of the limo, and he wants their first time as husbands to be to a song other than Hooked on a Feeling. There's nothing wrong with that song, as Guardians of the Galaxy has proven to us. I adored that scene. Can we just talk about for a minute the time capsule that this book is? So Robin makes him a mixed CD. I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) There's reference to the Gilmore Girls in here. Yes, there was. Which was hit at the time. There is a line where somebody actually says, map quest me those directions. Do we remember MapQuest? That made me chuckle (laughs) in the time before, you know, Google Maps and GPS. It's a lovely time capsule of 2007 on top of just being a really wonderful story. I don't know many authors who could take what's really so many disparate elements between the getting ready for the wedding and the wedding, managing another love story between two side characters, putting all the suspense elements in it, because you really had two separate suspense elements between going overseas and then dealing with the stalker guy and wrapping it all into a beautifully cohesive package. I mean, really kudos to Suzanne Brockman and her storytelling techniques. Yeah, I think the way that she weaves so many different elements together into such a wonderful story, because you're right, there's a lot of stuff going on. The story of the wedding, the stalker storyline the new romance between Will and Delphina, you know, checking in with various characters from other books. It's an awful lot to juggle, but I think Suzanne Brockman does a really beautiful job here. I could imagine for anyone who is a fan of the Troubleshooter series, this would be deeply satisfying, but it's also a really wonderful story for someone who is encountering these characters for the very first time. And here in our discussion of the various plot points in the book, I'm not sure we were able to adequately express some of the more intimate aspects of the story. Like at the beginning of the book, there's the conversation that Robin and Sam have, several quiet, intimate moments between Robin and Jules, really wonderful character-driven moments that ground the story And help pull you in so that when we encounter some of the more outrageous comedic moments or more tense action oriented moments, we care about them. Mm -hmm. And it's also, as we mentioned before, she does all this in a way that if this is your first troubleshooters book, you don't feel out of your depth either. Because it was certainly my first troubleshooters book, although now I want to go back and gobble up more about (laughs) Jules and Robin for sure. But it's just wonderful. And I want to say, too. We don't often talk about the author's notes in these books. I'm an author's notes reader. I will always read the author's note to whatever book I've read because I want to see what the author additionally has to say. I encourage everybody to read the author's note here. This was written by Suze as Massachusetts was potentially losing its marriage equality that it had already won. And there's it, the author's note is so heartfelt about why Jules and Robin exist. It's a nice kind of companion piece to the interviews uh, that we have with Suze, if you listen to those in that listener favorite episode. Really heartfelt stuff there, so I encourage you to read that at the end of the book as well. So all in all, I think it should come as no surprise that I certainly enjoyed revisiting this particular story, and I hope that if you haven't had a chance to read all through the night that you will give this story by Suzanne Brockman a try. Now you may be asking yourself, Will, what happens after the events of All Through the Night? Indeed, I am. I'm so glad you asked, because in the awkwardly titled Beginnings and Ends and When Tony Met Adam, Suzanne has collected some of the short stories that she's written in the intervening years, covering some of the events and characters featured in this particular book. So if you're curious about what is happening to Robin and Jules, the story Beginnings and Ends has got you covered. It takes place five years after All Through the Night, and Robin is enjoying a whole lot of success playing a closeted actor in his cable TV series. But one day an onset incident leaves Robin feeling triggered, and he's really rethinking the direction that his life has taken. Not his relationship with Jules, because that's as rock solid as ever. But after taking some time to reevaluate, the two of them decide to change things up. They're going to get a new place, take advantage of some new job opportunities, and maybe even expand their family. Something unique about this story is that it also focuses on the fictional character of Joe and his storyline on Robin's TV show. I'll admit, as I was reading this, at first I was a little bit annoyed because, you know, I don't care about Joe. I want to know all about Robin and Jules. But... Suzanne Brockman is a pro, and by showing what Joe is going through and exploring the parallels 
that the character has with Robin's life, we get a much better idea of what Robin is feeling and why he makes some really big life choices. We even get to experience the final scene in the final episode of the show, which sends Joe off on his happily ever after the same way that Robin was able to find his with Jules. Damn it, Brockman, you got me to care about this silly fictional character. (laughs) It's very kind of like interesting how, you know, you've got the fictional character of Jules and then you're going inside another fictional character who he plays on a show. It's very... It's stories within stories and it's handled in a really interesting way. I like what she did here with this particular story. And I can't believe that you mentioned that they might give up their place. They work so hard on that money pit. New horizons, new beginnings. Now, the theme of redeeming irredeemable heroes is something that romance authors have been tackling since time in memorial. But redeeming the character of Adam is going to be a very tall order, but it's a challenge that Suzanne does not shy away from and tackles in When Tony Met Adam. Now, this story takes place mere moments after we saw Adam in All Through the Night. If you will remember, Adam was pulling the same shit he always does, trying to cause problems between Robin and Jules, and Sam kicked him out. And as he was leaving their brownstone, a Navy SEAL who was standing outside flirted with him. When Tony met Adam, picks up in that exact same moment. But this time, we get the scene from Tony's point of view. And that is when Tony, our lovable Navy SEAL, sets his sight on Adam and won't let anything stand in his way. Not even don't ask, don't tell. And it's because of this policy that he has to carefully navigate this new dynamic with his teammates. When Tony finally has a chance to see Adam, which Adam implicitly insists is just going to be a hookup and absolutely nothing more, Adam is, not surprisingly, a total dick when Tony arrives at his place, but there is a certain kind of chemistry, and they spend one amazing, phenomenal night together. Tony has to leave the very next morning, the problem being that he thought he had three days. He had this whole plan to make Adam fall in love with him. Tony is a really interesting character. He's strong and driven and focused. You know, he's a Navy SEAL, but he's also very young and he has a really interesting, naive charm, especially when it comes to the romantic possibilities with Adam, who is an unrepentant dick. (laughs) But, you know, if anybody can wrangle him, it's going to be a Navy SEAL. Exactly. Tony's unit is called away on a mission. While he's away, Adam can't stop thinking about him. It's at this point that Suzanne fills in the gaps in Adam's difficult backstory essentially explaining why he acts the way he does. It doesn't excuse it, but at least we can now better understand it. Kind of getting a much more detailed perspective on why Adam is so broken and self-destructive. While on his mission, Tony is injured when his unit is attacked. Adam doesn't want to care about Tony the way that he does, but he really has to commit to the idea of being there for someone as he fights to discover what has happened to Tony and his team. As we saw in All Through the Night, Suzanne Brockman really knows how to raise the stakes for the characters and really back them into a corner. Tony and Adam find themselves in a seemingly impossible situation. Adam wants to visit Tony in the hospital, but if he does that, it means outing Tony and possibly destroying the career that he's built so far. And it's how Adam navigates this particular situation that we finally see Adam grow as a person and not be such a self-involved jerk. And it gives me some hope that he's going to leave Robin and Jules alone now. Finally. Yeah, I really loved both of these stories. They took the characters in some of the situations in All Through the Night and then built upon them. They're not just, you know, fluffy little additions to the story, but an integral part of these characters' very long history in this particular series. What's nice about this collection is is that it's annotated by the author herself. And through these little mini hyperlinks, you're able to click on different pieces of the story. And Suzanne explains some of the backstory, telling you why certain characters do or say certain things. She also talks about her writer process, why she chose to exploit certain character flaws. And even at certain points, she explores the history of when the story specifically is taking place especially in the case of Tony and Adam, who are exploring the beginning of their relationship in the time of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and how unfair and truly devastating that was to our gay and lesbian service members. I'm so glad you read those extra stories and gave us that additional little bit. You, Folks, you got a couple extra things to read, and I'm going to dive into those because I want to read those stories for myself as well. All right, I think that'll do it for this month's book club pick. 
Coming up on Monday in episode 278, Jay from Joyfully Jay and Lisa from the novel Approach are going to be joining us for the first of our year in review episodes. Yes, hang on to your book buying budgets because even in the year end episode, they're going to give us some things that you might want to be picking up to read. We're going to also get from them a little holiday moment as they tell us one of their holiday favorites from this year. Plus, we're going to get a little sneak peek of what they're looking forward to in 2021. So you're not going to want to miss that. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, please stay strong, be safe, and above all else, keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Our original theme music is composed by Daryl Banner.